My name is Ryan Paul, and I teach history here at SUU. And I want to thank Dr. Lynn Vartan and her incredible Apex team for making this speaker series possible. I would also like to thank the generous donors to the Paul Petrick Dubon Memorial Fund for the promotion of the national parks for sponsoring this event. It all started in 1986 with founder Steve Hoffman, who first began his pioneering effort to learn more about raptor migration in the U.S. West. After a few treks up the trail of the trail of slopes of steep western mountains in search of these migrating birds, Hawkwatch was born. Since then, the organization has counted, banded, gawked at, gauged, and gathered data on millions of birds heading south for the winter. The mission of Hawkwatch International is to conserve our environment through education, long-term monitoring, and scientific research on birds of prey as indicators of ecosystem health. Over the years, the efforts to sustain and protect these remarkable creatures have led them to study and learn from these predators during all aspects of their lives, from spring nesting to fall migration and winter survival. What they have learned has informed land managers, scientists, recreational bird watchers, and the rest of us about what raptors need to survive in a rapidly changing landscape. Our presenter today, Melissa Halverson, works as the Education and Outreach Director for Hawkwatch International. Melissa credits her love of animals to early years spent following her biologist father around in the field whenever she wasn't in school. After completing her degree from Weber State University, she began working as an interpretive ranger for the National Park Service. It was doing this work that helped her realize she could unite her love of storytelling and the natural world by working as an informal environmental educator. Since then, she has worked for Utah State Parks, the Ogden Nature Center, Alpine School District, and most recently, the Loveland Living Planet Aquarium as the engagement and learning manager. When Melissa has spare time, she likes to read, play complicated board games, and start craft projects she never intends to finish. She has a fantastic husband, two incredibly smart and nerdy children, those are her words, not mine, and lots of adorable pets. It is my pleasure to welcome Melissa Halverson to Southern Utah University and the Apex Stage. for you today. And so after my presentation, I'm going to make you sit through the talking part first. But after my presentation, uh, myself and my colleague Issa Schwartz will be here with two of our Raptor ambassadors from Hawkwatch International. And so I'm really excited for you to get the chance to meet them. And that's an experience that happens best kind of up close and personal, which is why I decided instead of doing it here on the stage to uh, give you all an opportunity to kind of come up and really encounter those birds up close. I think that's the best way to meet a raptor. So as uh, Ryan mentioned, our mission at Hawkwatch is to conserve the environment through education, long-term monitoring, and scientific research on raptors as indicators of ecosystem health. And I brought this up again because I want you to remember those last four words, indicators of ecosystem health. That's going to be really important to the story that I'm going to tell you today. And so hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better understanding of why we picked raptors. Of all the animals in the world that we could study with the goal of conserving an environment or an ecosystem, why choose raptors? But before we get into the specifics of that, I want to tell you a story. Um, I love stories. I think I actually have an English degree, and I think stories are a really powerful tool for talking about science. And so we have three major players in our story. The first is a chemical called DDT. Now some of you may have heard of this chemical before. It has a pretty famous history. For some of you, this may be new. I hope everybody here learned something new today. The second player in our story is a woman named Rachel Carson. And Rachel has a really important role in this story. And the final player is a bird a species of bird called a peregrine falcon. So we're going to go through this story and learn how all these things connect. And we're going to start with DDT. Now I'm going to have to read off this because DDT stands for dichloral diphenyl trichloroethane. So I'm just going to call it DDT. <laughs> it's a lot easier to say. 
So DDT was actually first synthesized in 1847. It had been around for a long time. But that happened at a period when chemists were really just experimenting to see what they could do with molecules. And carbon, which is the base of DDT, happens to be a really stable molecule that you can kind of pull different parts off and attach new ones and make brand new chemicals. And so that's what was happening when DDT was first synthesized. But it was a chemist um, named Hermann Mueller, whose picture is up here, who really discovered that DDT was an incredibly potent insecticide. Mueller was tasked with finding an insecticide that would target the insects but not hurt other animals, including humans. And one of the things that made DDT really effective is that insects didn't have to eat it. They just had to come in contact with it. And it immediately started working on their nervous systems and killed pretty much every insect that they tested it on. So Mueller was really excited by this because at that time, there was a lot of insect-borne disease. So in 1939 was when Mueller discovered these effects. And if you know anything about history, you know that that was a time period when the world had a pretty serious event going on. And we were in the midst of World War II. And so Mueller's discovery became a really powerful tool that was used by the Allied forces to combat disease. So the other picture you're seeing here is from Naples, Italy. So after testing DDT in the lab and in some small field studies, the Allied forces decided they needed a bigger test case. And so when the Allies retook Italy, they found in Naples there were all these refugees that had come in, and there was a horrible outbreak of typhus, which is a disease that's spread by lice and ticks and other biting insects. And so they decided, you know what, we are going to treat the people in this community with this new chemical. So they made a powdered form, they mixed it with other powders like talc, and they basically sprayed it directly onto the bodies of these people. They would have them hold out their clothes and insert the sprayer in and just spray their whole bodies and sometimes their hair, which today we might feel like, that might be a little bit risky, but uh, it actually worked really well. They eliminated typhus in Naples, and over the course of two years, over three million people were treated directly with DDT in this way. And because of that, they recognized that DDT could be used to fight all kinds of diseases. Another big problem the Allied forces faced was in the Pacific Theater, and that was malaria. Malaria caused many more casualties than actual combat. Um, at one point, kind of before the widespread use of DDT, 60 to 65% of soldiers reported having malaria at some point. So that's a huge amount of people. And unfortunately, malaria kind of hangs out in the body, and it can flare up again, and then recede, and then flare up again. So it's a long-term problem. Well, they use this DDT to treat the mosquitoes that cause malaria, and they essentially enabled their forces to fight malaria-free for the remainder of the war. And in fact, the reason we don't have malaria in the United States today, and in many other developed countries, is because of the use of DDT. So there's no doubt that DDT saved millions of lives, and it is still used to control malaria in some parts of the world today. So it was a really important discovery, and, and Hermann Mueller, who discovered the insecticidal properties, he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine um, for that discovery. Well, after the war, we had had this great experience with DDT. It was clearly super beneficial. It was a good tool for human health, and, and companies were like, we need to market this. We need to sell it to people. We all know about sort of the post-war boom in America. Um, America was in a good place after World War II for uh, economy, right? They were, there lots of people were having babies and families, and there was all these factories and infrastructure we had created to support the war. So a lot of these companies that manufactured chemicals for warfare switched over to making chemical pesticides. And DDT was widely marketed, as you can see, um, not only to farmers, but to housewives in particular. They had it in all sorts of formulations. They had it in paint you could put on your walls. They had it in creams you could put on your skin. Um, they had shelf paper you could put in your kitchen where you then put your plates and your food and things like that. And this all seemed okay because in all the people who were treated with DDT during World War II, there was no observable 
ill effects that they saw. So they felt like this was a safe practice. Now, there were some critics. This uh, picture is from the National Geographic in 1945 from a, an article called The World of Tomorrow, in which DDT was kind of lauded as this chemical that was going to help human health, right? Um, but they did note that if we use too much DDT, there could be problems because in the lab, what scientists had seen is that in many species, small amounts of DDT didn't seem to cause any problems. But DDT is really persistent. One treatment of DDT could last for years. And DDT is really easily stored in fat. And so when animals ingest DDT, it doesn't go away. It kind of stays in their bodies. So one small exposure might not be a problem. But then a small exposure and another small exposure and another small exposure over time, you could build up this toxic sort of reservoir of DDT. And so there were some scientists and people who warned about potential problems. But unfortunately, the general public embraced this idea that DDT was a, a wonder chemical. And for sure, the companies that made the products promoted their use to city, state, and federal governments. And the vast majority of DDT that was applied to the landscape was applied via these aerial sprays on huge swaths of land. They were using DDT to control lots of different insect pests, like gypsy moths and fire ants, most of which were introduced. They were invasive species. But they didn't really have an economic or health impact on humans and or crops. But we felt like, this is a pest. We can get rid of pests. Why don't we get rid of these ones, too? So we had all these planes left over after World War II. They retrofitted these planes to become DDT sprayers. And so even though there were scientists and people speaking out against it, they really didn't have as much of an impact as they would have liked. Even people who had private property had a really difficult time trying to stop spraying programs from getting onto their property. There was one woman named Dorothy Colson, who was a farmer in Georgia, who tried to stop the DDT on her property. They sprayed it anyway. All of her chicks died, all of her bees died, and her cows got sick. And her daughter got a persistent sore throat. But nobody listened to Dorothy. She was a minority. Now, this is where our second player comes in. This is Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson was a scientist and a writer. And she was obviously born long before, in 1907, before all this DDT stuff happened. And she grew up at a time when a lot of women didn't even complete high school. But she not only did that, she got a bachelor's degree in biology. And then she also got a master's degree in zoology. And she probably would have gotten her PhD as well. But that happened to be in the 1930s. And her father lost his job and she needed to support her family. Her father died not long after that, so she was kind of stuck, which was unfortunate because she had a really brilliant mind. Um, Rachel Carson ended up working for the US Bureau of Fisheries, which is now the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And her job, she was hired as a junior marine biologist, but really what they quickly learned is that Rachel was a really gifted writer. And so her job was to write these bulletins for the general public kind of saying, hey, this is what the fisheries is up to. And several people had attempted this job before her with pretty limited success. I don't know why people aren't fascinated by fish stocking stories and things like that, but somehow they just weren't interested until Rachel came along and she was able to take this really complex scientific information and write it in a way that was appealing to a general audience. And so she got really good at it to the point where there were even like radio plays that were built around her bulletins about the Fisheries Bureau. She was only the second woman working at that time for the Bureau when she was hired. Well, over the course of her career, she rose to the chief editor of publications in the Bureau. And while she was there, she wrote not only for her job, but she also wrote magazine articles. And they were published in pretty prestigious places like The New Yorker and the Audubon magazine. And really what Rachel loved most was the sea. So she happened to write a book about the ocean called The Sea Around Us. And it came out 
after the war had ended and people were ready for kind of an escape. They wanted to visit other places in their mind. And here was this beautiful book about the ocean. And that was a subject that was not really a widespread um, topic at the time. So this book was wildly successful. And she ended up writing three books about the ocean that sold really well and eventually enabled her to leave her job at the fisheries and become a writer full time. Now Rachel first heard about DDT in 1945. And she proposed to her editors, like, I want to write about this pesticide. I'm concerned about it. And they said, you know what? That's really boring. Nobody's going to want to read that. Just keep writing about the ocean. People love the ocean stuff. Well, once her books became bestsellers, she was able to kind of say, you know what? I'm going to choose now. It's time for me to write what I want to write. And she spent four years writing the book Silent Spring. I hope all of you have heard of Silent Spring, if not read it. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic book, and what it was, was a really well-reasoned argument that the, the unrestricted use of chemical pesticides was problematic. She wasn't saying no pesticides, she was saying, we need to look at the research and really understand the long-term effects of what we're doing. So she wrote this book, and it was a huge hit. I don't know how to express how popular Silent Spring was at the time. It was, before it was published, it was serialized in the New Yorker. So it got a lot of exposure that way. It was also chosen as a book of the month club, which at that time in rural America, there were a lot of people who didn't have access to libraries or bookstores. So if you were a reader, the way you got your books was through a mail order service called book of the month. So if, as a writer, if your book was chosen for this service, it was huge because it got to an audience that really didn't have access to it in a lot of other ways. And if you think about the topic of the book, rural Americans are really the people who probably had the biggest concerns about this unrestricted pesticide use. So Silent Spring was a huge bestseller. Many of the chemical companies that were sort of cited in this book were critical of Carson. They really came after her and attacked her but she was so methodical in her research, and she actually went to scientists and had them read it before it was published. She vetted this book so well that it just didn't stick. It just made more publicity for the book. In fact, I went in my copy of Silent Spring and counted. There's over 570 citations in Silent Spring, and the book is about half that length. It equals about two citations per page. So this is a woman who knows her stuff. And she was really great about communicating it. Her gift was taking that really, I mean, imagine 570 scientific papers, taking all that information and synthesizing it, and then writing in a way that was not only accessible, but it was enjoyable. The book is beautiful to read. And so thanks to this, um, this popularity, Silent Spring was actually chosen to be part of a CBS Presents evening special. So a television program that was broadcast into tens of thousands of homes. And once again, a new audience, right? Folks who maybe don't want to sit down and read a book about pesticides are more willing to sit down and watch a couple hours of a documentary. And in this program, kind of the general consensus is that Carson came off as extremely calm, rational, well-spoken, thoughtful. The chemical people also got to have their scientists interviewed as part of the program. And unfortunately, they tried, in order to make themselves look more professional, they presented themselves in lab coats, in a lab with all their equipment around them, and they were a little bit more hyperbolic. Um, they used language, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna find the quote here because it's a great quote. They used some language that was a little uh, intense. So one of these scientists was Robert White Stevens, and he said, if man were to follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the dark ages, and the insects and diseases and vermin would once again inherit the earth. So what came, what came off is people saw this program and thought, I'm going to go with the rational lady. <laughs> like, she seems to know what she's talking about. And it was so successful that their, President John F. Kennedy actually called a Congressional Review and had his Scientific Advisory Committee put together research on DDT and these other chemical pesticides. 
So the other picture you see here is Carson testifying to this scientific advisory committee. It was one of the last times she appeared in public. And part of that reason is you may notice that her hair looks a little off in these photos. That's because she's wearing a wig. The whole time Carson was writing and publicizing Silent Spring, she was dying from breast cancer. And she was really careful not to let that get out because she didn't want people to seize on that and say, this book is just a revenge plot. It's one woman's tirade against the disease that's killing her. She's trying to link these chemicals to the cause of her death. So most people didn't know until after she had already died. She died in 1968, just a few years after Silent Spring was published in 1962. So she did not live to see what happened with DDT. But we're going to talk about that next. We're going to come to the next player in our story, which is this raptor, the peregrine falcon. Now, peregrines are really beautiful birds. They're very iconic. Um, they are the fastest animal on the planet. And you'll get to meet a peregrine today if you stick around, which is very exciting. And these are fierce predators. They're inspiring. They're great birds. And unfortunately, there was some problems that showed up with these birds around the time that Silent Spring was published. Um, before we get into the peregrine story specifically, they were not the only bird that was impacted. Populations of pelicans, gulls, eagles, osprey, all of them were declining. And what scientists were seeing is that the eggs of these birds were cracking or crumpling or breaking in the nest. So the first real study on egg thinning was conducted in Lake Michigan by a man named James Ludwig. And he was an undergraduate. That island colony of herring gulls was the most productive herring gull colony in the region. And in the space of two years, it became the least productive herring gull colony in the region. And what he found is at least a third of the eggs were cracked or leaking. And the adults were not able to reproduce. So Ludwig and other people who were studying different species collected these eggs. They sent them to the lab. And you'll never guess what they found in the eggshells. DDT, lots and lots and lots of DDT. Even in places where DDT was used in concentrations that were considered safe, and that was, that was generally one pound of DDT per acre. So it's pretty diluted. They were finding really high concentrations of DDT in these eggs. It almost seemed impossible that they should be that high. Now, scientists had done laboratory work, like I said, and had had some concerns about DDT. But this was the first time DDT was explicitly linked to a phenomenon happening in the wild where they could have proof in the lab. And so this was one of the studies that was presented to that congressional committee that inspired them to act on behalf of these birds. So peregrines. Uh, during the 1950s and 60s, the peregrine population around the world dropped 50 to 60 percent, and that was due to this eggshell thinning. And in some places, it was even greater. Here in Utah, we went from having about 45 pairs of nesting peregrines to fewer than 10 by 1973. Um, in the eastern half of the United States, peregrines were extinct. They didn't exist at all in the wilds anymore. So people recognized that this was a problem, and they knew that they needed to do something about it. So what they learned is just 15 to 20 parts per million of DDT was enough to cause 15 to 18% thinning in eggshells, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's just enough that when those adults sat on those eggs to incubate them, they would break. And they were finding concentrations that high and higher in all of these samples. So as the government reviewed this information, in the meantime, the EPA had been formed, the Environmental Protection Agency. And one of their first decisions that they made was to ban the use of DDT in 1972 with some very restricted options for health conditions like malaria, where spraying could be used. Eventually, that ban just became blanket. Um, and that was followed by bans around the world because 
this wasn't just happening in the United States. Now, so we had widespread DDT use for about 30 years domestically here in the United States. During that time, we used 1 billion 350 million pounds of DDT. That's a lot of DDT. And remember, DDT is persistent. It doesn't go away. It's still in our soil, it's still in our food, and it's in all of you. Now, fortunately, the blood levels of DDT in the human population in the United States have really been dropping off since it was banned. So there's a lot less of it in you now than probably in your parents or your grandparents. Thank heavens. Um, the data you see in the bottom corner here is from a study in Greenland, which is looking at the thickness of peregrine eggs over time. They predict that the peregrine eggs will not return to their pre-DDT thickness until 2034. So this is still happening. It's still affecting things. But the peregrines were able to recover. Before we touch on that recovery, let's talk about what happened. How come a very small amount of DDT in the environment ended up in these sick birds? Well, it's due to a process called biomagnification. And I don't want to get too technical here, but basically, if you put a toxin or any sort of chemical into an ecosystem, especially one like DDT that is persistent and stored in fat, what happens is insects eat it, most of them die, but not all of them die. And guess what? The ones that survive reproduce. And insects' life cycles are very short. So in just a few years, what you get are insects that are resistant to the pesticide. So as DDT was used more and more and more, the insects became more resistant to it. So they're eating the plants and they're getting DDT in their bodies. And then other organisms are eating the insects, like these birds, and they're getting DDT in their bodies. But they're not only getting the DDT from the plants, they're getting all that DDT from the insects. And if you are a meat eater, you need a lot more calories to sustain yourself than a plant eater because energy transfer gets diminished the further you get away from that plant level of a food chain. So like I said, I don't want to get too technical, but essentially what happened is our falcons are apex predators. They're at the very top of the food chain. So they are ingesting all of these animals that are full of DDT and that is becoming magnified or concentrated in their bodies. So they're apex predators, top of the food chain. Human beings, guess where we are? Now we're omnivores, but we're still at the top of the food chain. Now there's arguably some places where maybe <laughs> we're not. There might be something that eats us, but we're pretty darn successful as a species. So if something is bad for raptors, it's generally bad for us. We kind of have that same spot in the ecosystem. So we recognize if peregrines were going to survive, they needed some dramatic intervention. And the first real step towards that was from a man named Tom Cade. Dr. Tom Cade at Cornell University began a captive breeding program. Now we hear about those kinds of programs all the time now, that people breed animals and then they put them out to the wild and then those animals can reproduce. That had never been done before. So this was really new cutting edge experiments. And every baby peregrine was incredibly precious because they were so rare, but fortunately, we had a really large stock of captive peregrines used by falconers, who are folks who hunt with birds, that they were able to use as part of this breeding program. So they would breed these chicks, then they'd send them off to different places around the country where the chicks were raised in the wild, on site, and then the goal was that they would reproduce. Well, as mentioned in my introduction, I was really lucky because my dad, this handsome fellow here, was the biologist in charge of the Peregrine Reintroduction Program here in Utah. And so he was there from the very beginning. And towards the end of that program, I was a kid. And so when I was really lucky, I got to go band the babies with him. So that's me in my first peregrine nest holding a baby peregrine. And so this is a really special story to me because it hits home. So here we have a timeline of the first offspring produced by parents that were raised by humans. And so that process, they would build these towers, they put a big box on top, they put some peregrines inside, these babies, and there's attendants that go up and feed them, 
and monitor them, but they don't let them see them because we don't want them to imprint on people. They wait until they fledge or start to fly, and hopefully these birds figure out hunting pretty quickly and they're able to reproduce. Well, that happened in 1983 in Utah. It was the first wild peregrine birth uh, west of the Mississippi. And so with that, we knew that this program could work. And in fact, it was a huge success. The peregrine falcon was removed from the endangered species list in 1999 and has been doing pretty great ever since then. So I love this story because what it shows us is that humans made a problem, but then humans were the ones who solved the problem. We're the only species capable of doing that, of making a mistake, recognizing that mistake, and rectifying that mistake. And it happened in a way where everybody got on board. This could not have happened if the general public's opinion and attitude had not swung towards conservation and preservation of a species. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from that. And so I want to take us up to modern times. So here's our great DDT story. I went and interviewed all the scientists at Hawkwatch and a few other folks that I know in the field. And I asked them, what is today's DDT? What's the biggest threat facing raptors? And I know these are hard pictures to look at. They all said, without exception, habitat loss and degradation. And a lot of that is due to climate change. That's a big problem, and it's hard to see. And so I want to talk to you about one place where we have specifically seen this habitat degradation impacting a raptor that lives right around here, and you may have seen flying around, and that's the golden eagle. So, Hawkwatch started studying golden eagles in 2010 in the west desert of Utah. So where you see this big oval, Cedar City is right there at the bottom, is the west desert. So this is, if you think about Utah and Nevada are pretty much, they have this big eco-region called the Great Basin. So this is where the Great Basin piece is in Utah. And it's pretty much, if you think about the Wasatch Mountains, everything west of the Wasatch Mountains to the Nevada border. So our scientist, Steve Slater, Dr. Steve Slater, started studying these golden eagles in 2010. And the first thing was, let's just look at, at numbers, right? Territories, where, how many birds do we have? So you can see this data. He was able to compile some data from before the study began. Um, and then we have our data going over in the 2000s. Now, when this talks about an occupied territory, what that means is they went out in the desert, they found a spot that like, this is an eagle territory. There's a place to nest, there's food. This would be a good spot for an eagle. How many of those had eagles in them? And you can see the trend line here. There's some pretty disturbing dips, especially as we get into the 2010s. And so we also looked at productivity. So in this, what you're seeing, the top line, which is blue for my colorblind folks, that is activity. So when we talk about an active productivity, we're talking about a territory that has two eagles, male and female, they've built a nest, they're attempting to reproduce. The bottom line, which is red, is successes. So of those attempts, how many of them were successful? Now, reproduction is a risky game at any time. So this is a lot more volatile. You see a lot more up and down. But overall, you can see it's a downward trend. So the first question was, OK, let's look at their food, right? That seems to be a pretty simple relationship. And the favorite food of eagles, of golden eagles, is rabbits. It makes up over 60% of their diet, um, sometimes higher, depending on where they live. So the next thing we did is we looked at population trends for jackrabbits. Now what you're seeing here, each color represents a different study site. And in these study sites, we were measuring the density per square kilometer. So they're marking off kilometers of desert. Somebody's walking through there. Sometimes it's through a road transect. But they're basically hitting the clicker every time they see a jackrabbit. Now, it may not surprise you to know that rabbits have lots of babies. They breed like rabbits, right? And so it's very natural for them to have population spikes. So they have a good year, there's some good forage, and they just take off. And then that's naturally followed, as it is in every ecosystem, when you have a population dramatic increase like that, you have a falling off on the other side. 
as resources become more limited because there's too many people or too many rabbits competing for it. So you can see like there's some dramatic ups and downs, but what I want you to pay more attention to is how high the highs are over time and how close together they are. So what you're seeing prior to 2000 is every 10 years or so, there's a jackrabbit peak. And then suddenly we get to 2000, and there's still some peaks here, but they are much smaller. And now they're spread out about every 15 years. So once again, they said, okay, what do I need to look at here? Let's look at the food of the jackrabbits. So jackrabbits live in a sage-dominant ecosystem. Y'all know what that looks like because you live here, right? You can look out your window and see this. When we have a healthy sagebrush ecosystem, it looks something like this. It's dry, it's desertified, but there's a lot of sagebrush and pinions and junipers and other plants. Now sagebrush is what we call a keystone species. Everything in this ecosystem around you is really reliant on that sagebrush functioning well. Even the other plants that grow here depend on the deep roots of a sagebrush to bring moisture closer to the soil surface when it's dry. So sagebrush is important. And this is a really gross oversimplification of a sagebrush food web. There's a lot going on here, and this is not even close to, to you know, displaying the, the true complexity of this ecosystem. But what you can see here is there's a lot of diversity. If I were to take this butterfly and it got removed from this ecosystem, there would undoubtedly be impacts. Some species populations would decline, others might even rise because that butterfly disappears. But it's unlikely that anything else will completely fail or go extinct because there's lots of other connections to fall back on. When you hear the term biodiversity, this is what we're talking about. The more diversity in an ecosystem, the more opportunities it has to become resilient and recover from changes to that ecosystem. Well, what we started seeing in 2000 was a new dominant species in the West Desert region that was popping up everywhere. What you're looking at here is a picture of cheatgrass. Cheatgrass is an invasive species. It's actually been in America since like the 1800s. It's been here a long time. But it really wasn't causing huge problems in the Intermountain West until things started to get drier and drier and longer between storms. So as the climate changed, this cheatgrass started to move in. And cheatgrass, unfortunately, is really only green, and it's really beautiful when it's green, but it lasts for a few weeks at the end of spring and the very beginning of summer. And then it goes into what we call senescence, which is basically dormancy. So it's this dry, yellow stuff. And as you can see, there's not much out there. So here's a cheatgrass food web. There's been actual studies um, conducted on Antelope Island State Park that have found that really the only things that can easily use this dormant cheatgrass are some harvester ants and a few species of rodents. They didn't even really find snakes out there eating the rodents. There just weren't enough of them because cheatgrass can support some, but not enough to get a bigger predator in there. So if I were to take anything out of this food web, it could be catastrophic, right? There's nothing to fall back on. So cheatgrass is a problem, and there's a bigger, not only does it, is it not useful to a lot of different organisms, it has another problem linked to it. So I'm gonna show you a map here, and what you see is the darker the color, and it happens to be green, um, the more herbaceous vegetation we're seeing, which is essentially cheatgrass in this part of the world. So we're seeing annual grasses that aren't shrubs, they're herbs, right? So you look at our West Desert region, right? We figured where that was on the map. And you can see, this is from 2018, that's a lot of herbaceous ground cover that's sneaking in. Now here's another map, and this one's actually only from 2011. I couldn't find a more current version, which I think would probably look even more different. But what you see here is the historical incidence of wildfire, how often wildfires occur in different parts of the world. And once again, the darker the color, in this case it's red, the more fires we have per year, historically speaking. Now, the really, really, really dark color next to the Great Salt Lake represents non-burnable land, that's the salt flats. So there's nothing to burn there because nothing grows there. 
Let's look at them side by side and forgive how pixelated this is. But you can clearly see on our map here, there's a correlation, right? We've got lots of grass growing, lots of wildfires happening in that part of the state, more than we see in other parts where we don't have that grass coming in. So cheatgrass, as you can imagine, when it's in this dry, dormant state, is a fantastic tinder. Just a very small spark can take off as a fire. You all, if not live here permanently, you live here now. So you know wildfire is a problem. If you spent the summer in Utah this year, you know wildfire is a problem. Even though we didn't have fires in our backyard necessarily, we were still experiencing the effects in the form of air pollution, right? I don't know about you, I had a cough all summer that I was struggling with. So cheatgrass is a big contributor to this. And the problem is, not only does cheatgrass light on fire really quickly, it then spreads that fire into sage dominant areas, and cheatgrass loves disturbed soil. It's really quickly to populate that. So once that fire burns out, that burn area, is great seeding ground for more cheatgrass. Then we get more tinder, bigger fires. So cheatgrass is a really big problem. So we all started this with the golden eagle, right? This golden eagle we saw had declining population numbers. So our scientists said, well, let's figure out what's going on. And even though the problem ended up being way back at the beginning of the food chain, in the plant level, the eagle was the first indication that that was happening. So remember, indicators of ecosystem health. Raptors, because they are apex predators and because birds are naturally more sensitive to environmental change, are fantastic tools for getting a snapshot of how healthy an ecosystem is. If you have a healthy raptor population and they are reproducing successfully, that means that ecosystem is probably safe not only for those birds, but for you and for your family and your kids and your friends and your pets, it's a good place to be because it's a stable ecosystem. Everything has to be in place to support that raptor. So sometimes raptors can adapt to some changes. One thing we noticed in the case of cheatgrass is that they were looking for new sources of prey like these gopher snakes. Now, that chick has food but it's not as good as a big juicy jackrabbit. It's gonna take a lot more snakes to equal the same number of calories. Mom and dad are working a lot harder. Often golden eagles will lay two eggs and what we're seeing is it's very rare for both chicks to survive to adulthood. Generally one egg ends up kind of being an insurance policy. So when we do have nesting, we're struggling to feed the babies. So what do we do? This is a hard question, right? How do we solve this problem? How do we help raptors? We can't make cheatgrass go away by ourselves. And so I think we can look to DDT. What happened with DDT? Well, first of all, somebody did the research to figure out that there was a problem. And then they used their voice to share that information with other people. And that wasn't the end. In order for DDT to go away and for peregrines to come back, the tide of public opinion had to turn to the point that policymakers recognized that they needed to act in order to keep their constituents happy. And so it took this government action to ban DDT, but that didn't save the peregrine in and of itself. After that, we needed more science. We needed people to go out there and find the links between that chemical and what it was doing to wildlife. And then we needed NGOs and nonprofits and other organizations to pick targeted solutions for specific locations and species that worked. So it was a very multifaceted approach. Just like that really diverse ecosystem in order to solve big problems, we need diverse solutions. There is no one magic bullet that is gonna make this go away. It is gonna take a lot of different approaches and different people and different minds working on this problem. Now, if you're like me, sometimes you feel like these pigeons. You just wanna check out, 
right? Like, this is too hard. I can't do this. It's too much. Give me the phone number. I'm done. Um, it's really overwhelming. And I think the reason we feel that way is because there are people who would have you believe that the most important tool you have is your dollar, that the way you save the world is to stop using plastic straws, to buy reusable grocery bags, to drive an electric car. And those are all great things to do if you can do them, but they are not accessible to everyone. And it's misleading to think that we can spend our way out of this problem. And it's misleading to think that you as the individual have to solve it through your choices alone. That's not how this works. We have to come together. And the most powerful we tool we have is not our dollar. I think Rachel Carson showed us the most important tool we have is our voice. If we let our voice be silenced and we try and spend our way out of this, it's never gonna change. What needs to happen is that we need to speak with our voices. And you know what a great place to start is? is in your local ecosystem. What raptors do you share this ecosystem with? What things could give them a little bit more of a fighting chance? How do you support that? Because when those raptors are healthy, so are you. So is your family, right? So start there. It's not going to change until enough people speak out and talk to the people in power and convince them that it is important to us to make these kinds of changes. Now, I want to leave you with a quote from another scientist that I really love. His name is Carl Safina, and he's an ecologist. And he makes this argument that all of this thing that I just talked to you about, using your voice, that the real way we save the world is democracy, is that we really believe in this concept of freedom and justice for all, but we take that all concept away from just humans, and we really mean all, because it's easy to feel disconnected from your ecosystem, but guess what? You are not. Just like we saw with DDT that's in our bodies right now, we are connected to our ecosystem whether we want to be or not. So all has to mean people, it has to mean animals, it has to mean wilderness, it has to mean the planet. And whether your cause is child welfare or climate change or whatever, then we're all united looking for justice because that's part of the all. And Safina says that justice comes from compassion, which is a completely unique human trait. Once again, here we are, the only species that we know of anywhere that is capable of compassion. And so this is what Safina says. Let me get to my quote here. He says, that compass of compassion, it asks not what is good for me, but what is good. Not what is best for me, but what is best. Not what is right for me, but what is right, and not how much can we take, but how much ought we to give, or how much ought we to leave behind. Not what is easy, but what is worthy, and not what is practical, but what is moral. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yay. All right. Make sure that you've got me. Yeah? OK. Um, thank you so much. And now we get to the birds. The birds. <laughs> so we're ending a little bit early today because um, we really wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to have a little up close and personal time with the birds if you want. We're going to have two stations set up. Melissa is going to be in here on the stage with one bird and her colleague Isa is going to be in the lobby with another bird. But in order to approach the birds, there are some specific rules and regulations. What are they? Sure. OK, well, one thing I want to express is that um, policies that protect humans from COVID don't, aren't accessible to birds. So they can't get vaccinated. They can't wear masks. Um, and we don't know how potentially dangerous COVID is to wildlife. We know it can spread to animals. So if you have a mask, I'm not going to say you have to wear it, but we really appreciate you if you're taking, taking that precaution, especially because you're going to be getting closer to us. So for me, if I'm going to put down a drop cloth, 
And once I have the bird out, I'll say, okay, we can go. And then people can start forming a line over here to come up. You can get close. Um, you can take a picture with the, you know, of the bird, all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna have Goose the Peregrine Falcon here. And then my colleague Isa is going to be out through the back door in the hallway. And she's going to have a Western screech owl named Artemis, who is, I saw someone gasp. They're pretty dang adorable. I'm not gonna lie. So we would love for you to meet the birds. We genuinely believe at Hawk Watch that like looking into the eyes of a raptor is a life, can be a life-changing experience. And I want you to have that. So give me one second to get situated and then we'll have you come on over to see our birds. And in the meantime, if we didn't do our traditional Q&A on stage, but we are gonna continue the conversation uh, during our radio show at 3 p.m. So if you wanna hear more and you liked what you heard and you kinda wanna hear a little more of the conversation back and forth, uh, that's gonna be at 3 p.m. KSUU, Thunder 91.1, and it will also be um, turned into our podcast later. So with that, we'll kind of officially close things, but again, if you wanna meet the falcon, if you wanna meet the owl outside, or both, we're gonna start lines in both of those areas. So thanks everyone, see you next week. Bye.